In this lecture, we're going to cover what linear momentum is and then go into some examples of it. Okay, so the de definition of momentum, um, it's going to be the tendency for an object to keep going in, in the direction that it's going, like how much, how much ability does it have to do that, right? Very close related to Newton's first law that says an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by another's force. Basically, we're, we're going to look at how hard is it to change um, the motion of an object. Okay, so we're going to use the letter P, either capital or lowercase, for uh, momentum. And that's going to be equal to mass times the velocity of an object. So the more massive an object is, the more momentum it's going to have. The more, the, the faster the velocity is going, the more momentum it's going to have. Okay, the time rate of change of the momentum of a particle is equal to the net force acting on the particle and is in the direction of that force. Okay, so that gives us the net force is equal to the rate of the time rate of change of the momentum. Right, so as momentum is changing, <coughs> you would need a force acting on that particle. Okay, so just manipulating this equation, we can see that, okay, so the net force is equal to dp dt. Right. Now taking out, just separating the dt, we know that p is just the mass times the velocity, right? That's the definition of momentum. And we can, we know that the mass is constant, so I can pull the mass out of this and just say it's the derivative of the velocity uh, per unit time, right? So this is just mass times dv dt. Okay. Well, we know that dv dt, you know, the, the change in velocity over time is our acceleration. So this is mass times the acceleration, right? And this is Newton's second law. All right, so that's kind of where we get this equation from. Okay. The linear momentum of a system of particles is going to be equal to the product of the total mass of the system, which is going to be big M and the velocity of the center of mass of that system, right? And in previous lecture, we showed you how to get the velocity or how to look at where the center of mass is. All right, so this is going to be the velocity of center of mass, and we're going to use a capital P here since we're talking about a system of particles. All right, therefore, the net force on a system of particles is simply going to be the derivative of our, of our momentum per unit time. Okay. So let's talk about collisions and impulse. Um, the collision of a ball with a bat col uh, with a bat collapses part of the ball, right? So there's a period of time that the collision is taking place. Now, in this case, the collision's brief, and the ball experiences a force that's great enough to slow, stop, or even reverse its motion. Um, the figure depicts the collision at one instant. Now, the ball experiences a force, Ft, that varies during the collision and changes the linear momentum of the ball. All right, so we can relate this force to this change in linear momentum. So the change in linear momentum is going to be related to the force by Newton's second law. Again, and this is what we have written. So... Um, if I just rearrange this slightly and put the dt on the other side, you get dp is equal to force times the derivative of, uh, of time. Um, <clears throat> so if I wanted to find the change in the momentum, right, I would just take the integral of both sides. All right, so if we did the integral... Uh, from in a period of time, right, from some initial time to some final time, which is basically the time of the collision. All right, this is just dp is equal to the integral of the other side. So it's again between the same period of time. All right, so f as a function of time, right, because f could be changing, then dt. Okay, so this is basically just going to give us our change in momentum, right, during some period of time. This this is the change in momentum during some period of time, and we're going to call that a capital J, which is going to be impulse, right? So the impulse is really just the change in momentum. 
And on the other side, you have um, this integral again from t, oops, sorry, it's ti in the bottom, to tf of the force times some unit of time. Okay, so if we had a variable force, um, we could do that. We could just simply solve this integral. But if we knew what the average force was and we knew what the change in time was, we can simplify this equation. So really, our impulse, which is J, is equal to our change in momentum, right? So this is really just going to be mv. Oops, excuse me. It's the uh, m vf minus mvi, right? This would be our change in momentum. Our final momentum minus our initial momentum is going to be equal to a force delta t, right? So the force times a change in time. All right, so our impulse is either the change in momentum or a force over some period of time, right? Multiplied by some period of time. All right, so in most cases, this is the simpler equation you're going to use. Now, if you had a variable force, you'd want to use this equation here to find the impulse. Um, but if we, if we, this is going to be F average. If we just wanted to find what the average force was, um, or we had a constant force, we could just use this equation here. Okay, so the right side of the equation is a measure of both the magnitude and the duration of the collision force, and it's called the impulse of the force J. Okay. So in these two pictures here, it shows you that the impulse in the collision is, is equal to the area under the curve, right? The integral of a force um, first time curve is going to give you the impulse, right? And that's going to vary depending on um, what type of collision is, it is. So you could find the same um, area under the curve if you simply just had a constant force for, for the same period of time. Right? If we knew what the average force was during this period of time, we could just say that it was the average and then the, you'd have the same area under the curve. Right? So that would also be your impulse. Now, uh, instead of the ball, one can focus on the bat. So at any instant, Newton's third law says that the force on the bat has the same magnitude but opposite direction as the force on the ball. That means the impulse on the bat has the same magnitude but the opposite direction as the impulse on the ball. <clears throat> okay, so let's do uh, an example problem. Okay, so a, a race car is going to uh, slam into a wall. So this is a race car wall collision. Um, the figure is an overhead view of the path taken by the race car driver as the car collides with the racetrack wall. Just before the collision, he's traveling at a speed of 70 meters a second, so his initial speed is 70 meters a second, along a straight line at 30 degrees from the wall. Just after the collision, he's traveling at 50 meters a second along a straight line at 10 degrees from the wall. Now his mass is going to be 80 kilograms. All right, so what's the impulse J on the driver during this collision? All right, well, we know that our impulse J is equal to, right, and it's going to be a vector, right, because it's in some direction. It's, it's our change in momentum, right, so delta P, which is simply uh, our final p minus our initial p, oops, looks too much like a row. And uh, so that's just going to be final velocity, mv final velocity times m times the initial velocity, or right, change in momentum. All right, so that's just m times the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Okay, now Again, we're talking about two different directions here, and we can split this into two different directions. So we can just look at the x direction, and we can just look at the y direction. And we're going to do that pretty frequently for these um, linear momentum problems. All right, so our impulse in the x direction is simply going to be the final velocity in the x minus the initial velocity in the x which is equal to, all right, so our mass is 80 kilograms. Our final velocity is going to be 50 meters a second times the cosine of negative 10, right? Because here's our angle, it's gonna be negative 10 in this case for the final, minus our initial, which is 70 meters a second, oops. 
uh, times the cosine of 30, right? Because our initial has an angle of 30 degrees from the axis. All right. And we get a value of approximately negative 910. And our unit is going to be kilograms times meters a second, right? The unit for our impulse is the same as the unit for our momentum, linear momentum, which is mv, so it's kilograms times meters a second. All right, now we can do the same thing in the y direction. So if we do that, our jy is going to be m times the final velocity in the y minus the initial velocity in the y. Plugging in values, we're going to get 80 kilograms for the mass. And then we have 50 meters a second. This time it's going to be sine of negative 10 minus 70 meters a second sine of 30, because right, we're talking about the y component. And we get a value of approximately 3,500 kilograms meters a second. All right, so our final impulse is going to equal negative 910 in the i direction plus 350, excuse me, minus. in the j direction, oops, right, and we can tell that by the picture. We know that um, it's going to be going down in this direction, right? This here shows you the impulse. All right, and that's going to be kilogram meters per second. Now, you can, um, you can go ahead and show this in magnitude angle notation if you wanted to. Um, the magnitude, you would just you know, square this and square this, take the square root, and uh, you get something like 316 kilograms meters a second at this angle of negative 105. Okay, um, so if the collision lasts for 14 milliseconds, what is the magnitude of the average force on the driver during the collision? Okay, well we know that average force uh, is just going to be our impulse divided by our delta t change in time, right, because this is coming from J is equal to F delta T, where this is F average. Okay, so uh, we can just go and plug in our value. So this is going to be 3616 kilograms meters a second divided by our time, which is 14 milliseconds, so it's 0 0.014 seconds. Oops. And you get 2.6 times 10 to the fifth newtons. Right? So that would be the average force on the driver as he's hitting the wall. Okay, that is it for this lecture. We'll see you next time.